Hello and welcome to The Quantum Bridge with myself, Casper, my co-host Gary, as always. And today, very pleased to have a guest with us. So before I jump over to Gary, hello Gary, how are you? I'm very good, thank you Casper. Yourself? <laughs> uh, yeah, all right, all right. Yeah. A little bit harassed today, but hey, it's part of life. Anyway, yeah. we've got a new guest and I'm really pleased about that and keen to hear um, about our guest. So I'll pass across to you and well done for finding him and please... Uh, introduce our guest yes so our guest today is kit walker um he probably might not remember this but we originally sort of discussed this uh recording back in june 2023 so we're now february 2024 and oh, we finally got together <laughs> yeah well i didn't realize it'd been that long thanks so much for uh persevering great to be here. <laughs> no it's been great and then obviously we've been in contact uh, over that period um so welcome to the show kit it's great to thank see you, you. Yeah, welcome much. thank you for having me That's thank right. you for um i mean maybe i'm aware but just a little bit of that background i mean you've been moving around i'm familiar you are in uruguay um so you've put in that on the map for us we haven't had anyone from there yet <laughs> <laughs> so maybe um give just a little bit of your background how you maybe ended up there and where your music started well, I mean, uh, you know, like probably most musicians, I, I started playing when I was young, like about seven years old, started studying piano. And, you know, by the time I was 14, I knew I wanted to be a musician. And uh, but also I got interested in spiritual kind of matters pretty young. I was, you know, in my late teens, early 20s when I started to realize I wanted to get serious about that too. So I've kind of had these two parallel things going on of of music and then, you know, spiritual study and practice and all that. And then at some point I started to realize that they really need to come together somehow. And that and that music really is a spiritual practice too. And I, and at this point, I'm starting to think it might well very might very well be the most effective spiritual practice that you could do if you approach it right. But anyway, I, I had the good fortune to have some amazing music teachers and and I never really did too well in the university uh, world. I went to a couple of different music schools, but dropped out of both of them because at that time there was no uh, there was no jazz, there was no improvisation. And what I really wanted to be was a composer, and they were, and they were trying to kind of funnel me into being a pipe organist, which was the instrument I majored on in in music school. But I could see, even though I love the organ, I think it's incredible. I, I could see I was going to end up just playing in churches all all the time, and and they wouldn't let me be a composition major because there aren't enough jobs for composers but everybody needs an organist, all the churches. So so I, that that just completely uh, struck me the wrong way. It had nothing to do with what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so I, I decided to just drop out and find my own way with music. And, and uh, I have some kind of a, you know, gu guidance or homing device or something that attracted me to, you know, a bunch of different uh, teachers over the years that were just amazing masters of music. I, it, it, so many of the meetings I had with my teachers were really kind of, uh, you know, synchronistic. That one in particular was this woman in Boston called Madame Shaloff, who was in her uh, 70s at the time when I met her. I met her on my birthday. And, she, and anyway, she, she had been the teacher of like Keith Jarrett. I don't know if you've heard of him. But a, a lot of the great jazz pianists that had gone through Berklee School of Music in Boston ended up studying with her on the side because she, wa she wasn't in any university. She was just a private teacher. And she had this technique that had been passed down from uh, generations uh, through Russia uh, of piano technique where you incorporate your breathing. And it's also very spiritually oriented. I think she was actually an enlightened being certainly very psychic. She could just look at you and tell you about your relationship with your mother or whatever. You know, she was really amazing. And and she took a liking to me. I only studied with her for nine months, but it was like profoundly transformative, completely changed my relationship to music and my playing. 
And then, <clears throat> and, and I was working on this technique, which involved using your breath and having your arms be totally weightless. It's like the chi that's playing the music, not the, not your muscles, you know? And so, uh, and so it was kind of like a Zen Cohen, like working with a Zen master on a Zen Cohen. And finally, towards the end of when I was studying with her, she she told me, yeah, now you're getting it. Uh, because the thing of having weightless arms and yet being able to play with force is really, uh, you know, it's it's a, it's an interesting quandary. But anyway, I, uh, uh, you know, and then right after that, she, she said, well, I guess you won't be needing me anymore. And she passed. You know, so it was like a thing where I got there. It was it was my birthday. It was Pluto conjunct my son, which is a major transit. And uh, and then eight months later, it was like, boom, and she was gone. It was almost like she waited for me or something. And then like, uh, you know, after that, I, I studied more uh, music, more with a composer who had been working with her. But I started to feel like what I really needed was a spiritual teacher because she had been that for me. And so I, I started off on that whole thing of trying to find a spiritual master. And I ran across Osho at that point. And, uh, you know, I, I just jumped in and I went to India and I spent about a year there with him. Uh, you know, totally controversial figure. But at that point, it was the, the late 70s. And uh, uh, just to be sitting there within that, within, in that room every morning, listening to him talk and feeling his presence for like, for a year was uh, just an amazing opportunity for me. You know, after that, he came to USA and started his whole ranch and he just crashed and burned. I, I think he got, uh, you know, hijacked by the cabal or whatever at, uh, around that time. I'm not really sure, but things got so weird that I, I just, you know, I severed my connection and went on my way kind of thing. But all the time trying to incorporate what I'm what I'm learning in meditation with the music, you know, because all kind of the whole time I've been like, well, how can I make the music better? How can I make the music so it really transforms people when they hear it, you know, because it seems like such a powerful language and a well, it is such a powerful language and it incorporates so much of uh, sacred geometry and uh, cymatics. And I mean, now the things I'm learning about it. Uh, and so, uh, you know, then I, I, after Osho, I, I started, I worked in several different spiritual schools, uh, including Tibetan Buddhism and, uh, and also uh, this school in Berkeley, California called the Ridwan School, which is uh, kind of a combination of spirituality and, and meditate, uh, spirituality and psychology. That was a seven year course I did, really going with a fine tooth comb through every bit of my psychology and, and, and learning how to awaken uh, essential states in the body so that you could, so you gradually go from being identified with ego to being identified, your true identity, which is divinity, you know, and, and there's so many kind of psychological blocks in the way especially, you know, these days we're so conditioned in so many ways. So I did like a lot of work just, uh, you know, clearing conditioning and, uh, and but, both, but all those different things I went through, I usually spent about seven years in something. Then at a certain point, it was like, oh, time to move on, you know, gra graduation. I always kind of felt like, well, once you've gone through college, you graduate and then you do something, right? And so, uh, so by then it was getting to be like the 90s and uh and well i i after the osho period i start i started my music career more seriously and i made a, a, an album on my own in a recording studio it was before computers before uh you know all the digital audio and everything so i kind of did a, a homemade version of an album i really wanted to make and I just sent it around to a few people and and this uh, company, Wyndham Hill Jazz. Wyndham Hill was kind of a famous record label, but they started a jazz division. And I was one of the first people they got on there. So all of a sudden I had this record deal and and I put out this album and it actually, it did kind of well. I was shocked. It, it got into this 
this uh, radio genre called the wave, which later turned into smooth jazz, but which I don't really like. But but uh, the wave was cooler. It was more like funky jazz, which which is what I've been into. Although I have a lot of classical background too. And so the, this album kind of took off and, and uh, it was getting regular airplay for like six years. And, and then the company decided to make another album with me. And so I made another one, which I like even better. It's even more kind of artistic or whatever. And that one also did pretty well, too. Uh, and then, but then my, the third one I, I submitted, I guess, was too much for them. And, and so that was the end of my contract after two albums. And, uh, you know, that kind of led to other things. I, I've toured around with some people like Kitaro. I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, he's a Japanese New Age musician. I, yeah. you know, I wasn't crazy about the music, but it was like a world tour and all that and i was kind of had my one foot in the jazz world and one foot in the new age meditation music world and trying to make a blend of it and i was kind of you know like the fire sign theater used to say how can you be in two places at once when yeah. you're not anywhere at all yeah yeah but so but that's because i'm a libra the whole thing has been constantly like I got my foot in two different worlds and I'm kind of straddling and trying to bridge them. Like that's why I really like your name, the quantum bridge. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so that's kind of, that's kind of evolved to the point where I'm, uh, you know, uh, well, I call it functioning while infinite, you know, it's like how to learn to be like here in the world functioning and yet being an infinite being at the same time. Usually when you get to this point of being an infinite being, you renounce the world and you go off into the mountains somewhere and, you know, but, but anyway, going back to my timeline, uh, by, you know, by the time 2000 rolled around, or it was 2001, actually, uh, I was in a, a kind of a group retreat and I had this massive breakthrough, like where I just, you know, I became one with the universe kind of thing, uh, really strong. And and uh, and I'd been kind of working at it, at it for a long time with the clearing of conditioning and learning how to gradually embody the being more. And and so at a certain point, it's like a critical mass happens where you're all of a sudden you shift over to the other side and that becomes your kind of base baseline and maybe you fall out of it, but you come back into it. And so after that happened, it was in 2001, right after 9-11. 9-11, like, just, just shocked me into action. And it so happened to be my 50th birthday, too, like, right when that when that happened. And so I had this major breakthrough, and then it, it really lasted for a long time. I was kind of like, you know, whoa, this isn't going away. I'd wake up in the morning, and it, it's still there, you know, this kind of sensation of the head is open on the top, and 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 everything is really connected and luminous and uh and so i was working with that uh, you know kind of trying to embody it more when i met my second guru which was uh th this american guy by the name of adidas samraj who uh by the time i got to him I, well he had just a really powerful presence and transmission but he was a very difficult kind of ornery character to get to know because he didn't want anybody around him that was, you know, bullshit. He wanted real people, and and you know, it was, you know, kind of you know, cults form around these people, and and it's all a, even though it's not supposed to be hierarchical, it gets into this hierarchy <laughs> thing, and somehow you 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 need you get the feeling you need to be near the master, you know, and that's how they manipulate you because they they can kind of. You know, if you if you need the access to the master, that's how the churches work for centuries. Then they can manipulate you and get you to, you know. But anyway, I I had already seen through that with the other one, so I I felt like with this guy Arida Samraj, just one darshan, one meeting of him would be was enough because everything started to happen in me uh, at that point. Like so he 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 clicked something for me. But somehow he felt it too, even though I never talked to him. And so the, all these op opportunities opened up for me to sit with him more. And and then by the time he passed, which was, you know, a few years later, I, I felt like this integration happened on a deeper level where 
the thing that was coming and going just stayed, you know. And since then, it's just been amplifying more and more until these days, uh, you know, I feel like I'm just electrified and, and uh, you know, it's like really intense sometimes. It's, it's too much. It's, he used to call it an ordeal, and I think it, that's a good word to describe it. It's not just like, all of a sudden, everything's great, and you're, you know. The way I see it now, it's a threshold that you cross that you just never go back over. But it's I, I consider it to be square one. Enlightenment is square one is another one of my, you know, it, it's like you graduated from kindergarten. You, you just took off your diapers, okay? Now you can get to work because it's infinite learning from there, you know. It's And, and that's uh, uh, the thing I have, you know, like I, I call it... Uh, 3D enlightenment versus 5D enlightenment. 3D enlightenment, you can tell the teachers in 3D enlightenment because they're still saying we all must die, you know? And then the 5D enlightenment to me is more someone like Saint Germain who, who uh, you know, just uh, disappeared and reappeared over the centuries. He took a body when he wanted to. And, you know, it, it's not like you have to be old and sick and and fucked and to in order to die you know it's like you can choose okay that's enough of this for now i'm gonna go somewhere else now uh so so anyway uh this, this whole quantum thing has uh gotten me <clears throat> more in that direction because uh i mean i don't know like i i i could talk now about like what i think quantum is because that's uh you know it's a thing we have here you guys but but Absolutely. It, it's just from my own experience internally with the uh illumination process that that like i was i ran across this guy uh walter russell i don't know if you know him he's a i've heard the name yeah yeah no he's he's brilliant i mean he's not alive now but but his teaching is there and he was a friend of nikola tesla and tesla yeah told, yeah Tesla told him he should he should put his teachings away in a vault for a thousand years because it's going to take that long for people to understand them. To catch up, yeah. 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 But like one thing I saw of his that that immediately clicked for me because I'm because I was feeling yeah, that's that's what's happening for me, is this thing of like uh that uh uh that instead of the two halves of the brain being minus and plus, you know, they're both plus, they're like a mirror image of each other. And minus is at the center. So like instead of being like this duality thing of left or right, black or white, you've got the, the quantum is is the, the central channel, which is the superposition of those two, which, which causes like infinite patterning. And that's what the function of the midbrain is. Not only the pineal, but the, the pituitary, pituitary and, all, yeah. and the reptile brain as well. I think they're all made to work together in connection with the heart and so like uh to me the quantum is is that where instead of being like black and white instead of being like republican or democrat you know or coke or pepsi or or ford or chevy you know i mean it goes on and on we got these two things and we, or, or like you know the one basketball team and the other basketball team and we're just watching the ball go back and forth you know it's like the hypnotist uh thing if you have this, I call it your central intelligence. If you have your central intelligence activated, then then you get you you not only get the two uh, zero and one, you know, like in the computer, but then you get the qubits they call it, which is the superposition of zero and one in infinite combinations, you know. And so, like all of a sudden, instead of having two choices, you've got like you've got like infinite possibility. That's to me. That's what the quantum is, and that, and and in the awakening, the, there's this channel of light, the, of bliss that rises from the heart into the brain, and and uh, and when the when the pineal really activates in the crown, then then there's this kind of sensation of the two halves of the brain fusing, you know. And I thought it was interesting to learn that that. Uh, the benevolent ETs, they don't have a, at least this is what I heard, they don't have a two hemisphere kind of brain. Their brain is just one, uh, one complete, you know, whole. But but to me, the awakening of the pineal kind of 
accomplishes the same thing where the, the, the two halves of the brain are fused in light. And then you, you don't fall for the black and white thing anymore. You see that there are always way more possibilities that you can, uh, you know, and, and it's up to you too, because you are the creator. That's the other kind of important piece of the puzzle is, you know, uh, the, this thing that you're, it's, it's your decision because this is a holographic projector which projects your entire reality. And yeah, it overlaps with other people's, but everybody's got their own universe, you know? I mean, where where do we go from here? I mean, yeah, so, I mean, it's a big, it's a big part of what we feel and we're trying to push is this creation part now. As a, yeah, as, as the people are sort of waking up and like I say, there's still a lot in that uh, duality, if you like. Uh, but it's watching people move out of that, which is quite interesting in a way. Right. Um, I was wondering how this quantum aspect has affected your music and the style of it. I mean, you mentioned earlier on about the chi sort of coming through and, and playing the instruments. Now, for Casper and I, we, we, we would look at that in a, in a martial arts sense of, yeah, well, very much like band hard, that sort of thing. You know, you're, you're soft, but you're applying power at the same time. But, right. Yeah. yeah how does so. this quantum aspect, of, you know, enhanced your music? Well, yeah, it's it, it's it's been fascinating kind of discovery actually because, uh, you know, I th this whole thing of the center line. I mean, in the martial arts, but also in the music, it's like super important. And I've seen uh, I've seen several articles about like how when they give children with like learning disabilities whatever exercises where their attention crosses the center line and it seems to help them kind of you know uh kind of heal in a way it and integrate so, in a way yeah. yeah 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 and so like and so like i started to look at the music well well first of all you know if you just think of drumming you know like you would never drum like this boom 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 always with the hands together it's it, people are always playing like this so there's this thing of the every time you every time you do that your attention crosses the center line and 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 so it, it lights up your your central channel that's how i feel it and and you can really uh take this it, it's like a practice to really brighten yourself and so i've decided uh, i started to make up a uh, rhythm exercises that that involve you know ways of different ways of crossing of your attention crossing the center line and uh and another thing that i noticed which to me is totally fascinating is that uh you know you can take a tone and if you slow the tone down enough you end up with a pulse a good example is like a motorbike, you know, it's like when it's idling, it's like boop, 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 boop. When you, when they, when you give it the gas, it's like, eh, you know, eh, it goes faster, it goes up, it goes slower, it goes down. So basically I could see right there, the connection between rhythm and, and tone, right. And mute and like melody. So, so then, then I discovered that what happens when you put two, uh, t tones together and you slow them way down you get a rhythm not just a pulse but you get a rhythm and uh, like two it, like like if you put, if put a fifth like c to g and you slow that all the way down you get two against three and so so i started to see oh wait so harmony is rhythm actually and then and, and that's very simple but 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 it can get really complex and if you put like one against two against three against four against five against six against seven, you know, that, that all these uh, cycles are going at the same time, you get these very complex rhythms that, that basically it's like a library of all the rhythms that have ever been played or, uh, you know, in, in all the time, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing actually. And uh, so I, I've written some stuff about that. I've got a blog where I write about a lot of these things. But uh, but these so these so these are called polyrhythms, and the th interesting thing I noticed about them is that they're all palindromes. They're all like uh, not reversible because it's the same thing if you put them in reverse, like the word radar, for example. Mm -hmm. If you turn the letters around, it's still radar. 
well, any any polyrhythm that you can think of, you know, five against seven, three against eleven, whatever, you know, that means in the same amount of space you've got one thing doing three, and then you got the other one doing eleven. Any of these polyrhythms are all palindromes, so there's like a mirror involved, and so that got me to the quantum thing of like, you know, you've got the you got the mirror here, and you got the mirror images there. The the uh, what I was talking about the Walter Russell thing before, you know, yeah. the two, two the two sides are mirror images of each other, and at the center it's like the fulcrum of the scales. It's it doesn't do anything. It's absolute stillness, but it's what causes the whole thing to happen. And uh, so I've been exploring that a lot because it it also ties in with the whole thing of the toroidal field, your toroidal field, right? And because when you get into the central channel and you really dissolve your attention there, that's when the when the toroidal field starts to activate. And and so uh, it occurred to me that every tone that you would create playing music would actually be a little toroidal field in itself, and that they can actually be sent to people to heal them. I mean, there's all kind of things with music. Uh, that we haven't even begun to tap into. Everybody's talking about 432 and 440, you know, and that 440 Hitler, Hitler, mm. you know, put mm. that there and it's bad and 432 is good because it adds up to nine. And, and you know, that's okay. I'm not against 432. It could be true. But, uh, but like, that to just stop there is like, it, you, you haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg yet. It's like the little piece of ice on the top of the iceberg but people wanted just a, a quick answer and so one of the things i would ask them is like okay so you take the nastiest heavy metal music you could find and you put it into 432 is it going to be like healing then you know and well, we so, would like so, to the metal now and again <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i know i mean everybody has their own taste in music uh, you know i i kind of uh I'm for the refinement and the going into it as a as a spiritual practice and and you know for raising your frequency and all that. And so you just have to, you know, check out whatever music you listen to and is this raising my frequency? And and for some people if if people are stuck in like depression or whatever, then getting angry is good for them. But you know, if somebody's like, you know, in a really blissful state, getting angry is just going to bring them down, yeah. So it really depends on where you're at on the spectrum in terms of what kind of music would lift you or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Keith, can I just, I suppose we're coming up to the end, but I just wanted to ask you a quick question about, because uh, you sort of touched on areas of this thing of balancing the the, the, the spiritual with the sort of more, more physical in a way, and certainly the audio now as well. I know that Gurdjieff talks a lot about the whole thing of octaves and so on, and sort of some of what you've alluded to sort of might have strayed into that more Gurdjieff and sort of uh, world. I just wondered if you'd come across Gurdjieff or if you have any time for his his teachings or Aspensky and so on, or if that's something that hasn't really raised itself in your... Yeah, no, I, I absolutely I have. And, uh, you know, I, re I read uh, Ospensky in search of the miraculous back yeah. in, in my 20s, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I had I thought a you might have done, yeah. I had a band and I used the Enneagram as the mm -hmm. symbol for it. Although yeah, I, great. Had, I had no idea what the Enneagram meant. But yeah. but now lately I, I have this article on my blog called Musicalizing Existence. And in it I've got a whole section about the Enneagram and Vortex Math. And what's interesting about the Enneagram, I think it's a diagram of your toroidal field. But Vortex Math is too. And I don't know if you've seen those two symbols. But they're a little bit different, even though the, they have the three, six, nine in them, right? Right. Yeah. And, and so, like, so, like, the the whole idea of the enneagram. Well, w the way I learned about it was a system of personality types. Mm -hmm. But actually, what it is, it's the octave, because yeah, yeah. the the uh, the number pattern is what comes when you divide one by seven, which is you know. The seven notes in a scale, the seven yeah. divisions between in an octave, and so uh, so I I wrote a whole thing about that in my oh in well, my, I, I should have uh, a look at that, and we will as well because I know we're going to run out of time. So I'd like to revisit all of this if you'd be kind enough 
to join us again, Kit, because it's too Absolutely. much to compress to compress no, your way experience. More, way yeah. more to talk about so, it. So we'll, we'll put that stuff in the show more and any other details mm -hmm. you want that can drive people to see more about your stuff. But please do consider coming back because you know this is this is like this is eating the elephant whole, and it's impossible <laughs> to, to do that mm -hmm. and get yeah, into exactly. all the you know yeah. It's eating, 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 it's even eating for me, yeah. I was going to say, even impossible for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kit, we are unfortunately going to have to leave it there. But I mean, you're welcome back because I find it fascinating, and I enjoy. Yeah. It. I'm getting back into making music myself again after oh, cool. decades of not doing it, and <laughs> so it's um, it's great, and we can talk yeah, well, about. Thank you. Everything. Thank you so much for having me. Really, it's the first time anybody's interviewed me about this, and uh, and I, I'm really excited to. To share it more because I, I think there's something there that uh, nobody's really seeing exactly. Yeah, agreed. It's important. I, you know, we're we're going to a whole new level with everything, and that includes music. Really, like music is is so connected to manifestation and everything that I think we can take it to a much deeper level than we have so far. Right, we shall do. Right, thank you. Speak to you again soon. Have a lovely weekend. You too. Thanks so much, guys. Okay. Cheers, Kit.